Hey peeps, we are back for more true crime. It's been a while since I've done any true crime. Sometimes it gets to be too much and I need to take a break, but we are back. We are talking Fear Thy Neighbor, season seven, episode one. So this takes place in Honolulu, Hawaii. The story follows a lady named Lois Kane. She's 77. She lives on Hibiscus Drive. She's a retired librarian. Those who knew Lois describe her as a very fun, outgoing person who makes friends easily. Lois had a very interesting life. When she moved to Hawaii in the 1970s, her first job was as a belly dancer. And then she worked as an actor, a choreographer, a costume designer for a youth theater. Lois sounds like an amazing lady. And Lois allowed Jerry Yarda Hannell, someone that she's known for over 20 years, live at her house rent free in exchange for him doing some maintenance around her house. When she originally met Jerry, Jerry was a maintenance guy at the condominiums that she used to live in before she purchased her home. We later find out that Jerry was actually fired and that's why he needed somewhere to go. Some of the owners of the condominium stated that Jerry was very hostile to them and very rude and that's why he was let go. However, when he moved into Lois's place, the neighbor saw how well he kept her garden. He had done some really good work around her property and everyone thought Yarda was a really nice man. You know, this was a very close knit neighborhood, you know, where they would spend time together. They would always socialize, stop by for drinks, have 4th of July get togethers, you know, things like that. Block parties and Yarda would always man the grill and people just thought that he was a pretty awesome guy. However, they did find out there was one thing that Yarda really was not a fan of. He was definitely not a fan of taking photos. Sure. No, oh. no, no picture. How come I just no run? photo. Come on, come no, on, no, don't no. Be shy. No, I said no photo. I meant it. You know, I don't know about you, but that is a huge red flag for me. You know, I do know a lot of people who do not like taking photos. Um, at one point in my life, when I was at my highest weight. I didn't want my photo taken either, but I never threw a fit. I just politely said, no, thank you. I don't want to be in the photo and went on about my business. I mean, that would be a red flag for me. At some point, Lois's mother became sick and she needed to fly back to San Diego to take care of her mom. You know, it's very important for her to be there for her mother and she left immediately leaving Yarda at her home and he was supposed to, you know, take care of the house and the property while she was gone. She didn't know how long she'd be away. It could be anywhere from six months to a year before she would be back. Yarda was originally from the Czech Republic. He later migrated to Germany and then moved to the United States. After around six months of Lois being back in San Diego, Yarda got extremely comfortable living at her home to the point where not only did he take care of Lois's property, he sort of labeled himself as the neighborhood watch guy and he started watching and taking over the neighborhood. Who is these tourists walking through the neighborhood? Hey! What are you doing? No! Erase them now! Go! They're watching us! He said, they're KGB, they're following me, they're watching me. Now to me, that is another red flag. You cannot harass innocent people who are tourists who are just trying to get good photos in your neighborhood. And the fact that he believes that these tourists are KGB tells me that he has post-traumatic stress syndrome. And this is a mental issue. Um, I think if that behavior persist, I would have had to call someone for maybe an elderly check and explain to them that he believes the KGB is watching him. I would have definitely at the very least called Lois in San Diego to let her know that Yarda is harassing people and he believes that the KGB is watching him. It's worth a try. No minions here, you go, you go. 
You go, I say you go. You have no leaders here. Lord, come on, that's my electrician. I have no choice. Now, as you can see, the neighbors are starting to get a little nervous. They think that his behavior is getting extremely erratic and it's starting to tick people off. And it would absolutely upset me. This type of behavior is not okay. Clearly there is a mental issue going on and there has to be a way to get help. I don't know if I would have felt safe enough, but I think I would have possibly tried to sit down and have a conversation with Yarda to see if it was possible that I could convince him to go to the hospital with me. They would then, I would assume, hold him on a 5150? I would hope. Out of nowhere, Yarda decides that he's gonna put up cameras. He put cameras up all around Lois's house. Cameras in every direction so that he could see the entire neighborhood from his house. He actually had screens where he could watch the entire neighborhood, including his closest neighbors. He has a neighbor directly next door named Warren. Warren gets extremely upset with the cameras because he says that the cameras are infringing on his life. Yarda is watching every one of Warren's moves, him and his entire family. He lets Yarda know that he has children and he doesn't appreciate that he can't come and go as he please. He can't check his mailbox. He can't get in his car. He can't have his kids out in the front yard without Yarda recording and watching every step that they make. And Yarda does not appreciate Warren having the audacity to be upset about his privacy being infringed upon. He would have these Google glasses on and then these big sunglasses in front of them to kind of hide them. But you can see him like managing it, taking video. Hey, 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 why are you fighting here? Now listen, hon, that there would absolutely make me call the police. Now, the only thing that would happen is the police would come out and tell me to mind my business. Yarda is on public property and he's allowed to record whatever he wants. That would irritate me. Um, of course, legally, there would be nothing that I could do, but I would be extremely ticked off if every time I came out of my house, I had a neighbor outside with his Google glasses following me around and recording. What are you recording for? I live here and I'm not a part of the KGB. That would just be a lot. I think another thing that would really tick me off is the cost of living in Hawaii is not cheap. These people pay a lot to live in this beautiful neighborhood this once peaceful scenic place. And now they're being harassed by Yarda who was living there rent free. That would definitely tick me off. But as if the Google glasses wasn't enough, Yarda has decided to get him a hat and prop a GoPro on top of his head so that he could prowl the neighborhood recording everyone. Clearly the man is unstable. So at some point, Yarda has decided that he doesn't approve of Warren's flowers, which are on Warren's property. And he takes a knife or a hatchet or something to him and tears the man's flowers up. And then when Warren comes out and finds his flowers have been absolutely demolished, he decides to take some pictures as evidence. And Yarda is not here for it. No, no photos. He really went crazy that Warren had come down and taken photos. You do not take photos, my property. Give, give easy, me the easy. camera. He ended up shoving uh, Mr. Daniels into a tree. Honey, listen. Warren calls the police. His shoulder has been dislocated. Yarda has really crossed the line here. And then he files a restraining order against Yarda and he receives a temporary restraining order. Some of the neighbors reach out to Lois in San Diego and she says that she sympathizes with them, but she doesn't think that Yarda's doing anything wrong and that maybe they're just misunderstanding him. So she allows Yarda to continue with this crazy behavior. At some point, the charges against Yarda have been dropped. And even though there is a restraining order against him, he still decides that he's gonna do whatever he needs to do to harass Warren. Then he gets a dog named Butch. 
Now, a lot of the neighbors are excited because he has this dog. Now he has something that he can concentrate on besides harassing the whole daggone neighborhood. He can spend time with his dog. However, he decides to use his dog to harass Warren. Every time he's outside playing with his dog, throwing the ball, he throws the ball into Warren's yard so that the dog can come into Warren's yard and harass Warren and his children who are out in the front. Oh gosh, but he hasn't broken any of the restraining order laws because he's not in Warren's yard, it's his dog. Little platform and he put a barbecue on top of it and filled that barbecue with wet leaves and lighter fluid and would light it so that this billowing smoke would just come into the Daniels house, the property. Honey, listen, this type of stuff would cause me to get a gun. Now I'm not saying I would shoot Yarda, but I am saying I'm, I would need a gun, you know? This man is acting erratic and you never know when a gun will come in handy. I'm just saying, Yarda's behavior is crossing the line. So he takes Yarda back to court. When he goes back to court, they update his restraining order and add additional restrictions. He cannot have his dog in Warren's yard anymore. He has to keep his dog on a leash and he cannot do the whole smoke trick again. He also cannot have any of his security cameras pointed at Warren's house, and he also cannot film using his GoPro in front of Warren's property. So with him not being able to focus all of his craziness on Warren, he decides that he's now gonna shift his energy towards another lady named Rebecca. Rebecca has been living there for over 20 years. When she's outside walking her dog or going to her car or anything, if Yarda sees her with her cell phone, he starts taking pictures of her and harassing her and accusing her of monitoring him for the KGB. I mean, seriously, the KGB, the woman has been living there for 20 years. She is not the KGB. She is not thinking about you, Yarda, and you cannot do this. Well, legally he can. Rebecca tries to get a restraining order against him and the judge told her since Yarda has not physically assaulted her or physically, you know, cross the line, he's allowed to take pictures wherever he wants to. He's allowed to stand out in a public place and take pictures of her and, you know, accuse her of being the KGB. So in the meantime, he continues to stand in front of her car, stand in front of her house. Every time she comes or goes, he's out there just watching her and snapping her picture. So she tries another route. She reaches out to Lois. And she tells Lois, listen, you know, this is getting to be scary. And she also lets some of the other neighbors know. And Lois and a couple of the other neighbors say that, you know, he's just harmless. He's an old guy, you know, he's probably lonely. He's just taking pictures. It's no big deal. Right, it's no big deal because it's not happening to you. Let him stand out in front of your house taking pictures and walking by with his GoPro and his Google glasses on and screaming at you that you're part of the KGB. Let him do that to you for a couple of weeks and see if he's still this harmless old guy. One thing that the judge does do for Lois is he sets up some sort of gentleman's agreement and it's for both of them. So they both sign this agreement. The agreement states that neither one of them will walk on the sidewalk in front of each other's homes. They will not take pictures of each other. Basically, they have to stay away from each other. Well, Yarda signed the agreement, but he didn't abide by it. Are you kidding me? The man is not all there. He continues to take pictures of this woman and stand out in front of her house with his GoPro on his head and yell and scream at her that she is a part of the KGB. Lois comes back home. Her neighbors get together and they all confront Lois about Yarda. They let her know that they are over it, that he is really a problem for the entire neighborhood. And she tells them that they just don't understand him. He's harmless. He means well, and maybe they should leave him alone. Ma'am, I don't think you understand. Go check Yarda's cameras. Check the GoPro, ma'am. These people are trying to live their life. They are not harassing him. It's the other way around. Lois truly believed that the neighbors were making a big deal out of nothing. And I don't understand why after all these years of living there, she didn't realize that they are not crazy. They're not making this up. The man is harassing them. He is going through something, ma'am. Shortly after Lois returns home from San Diego, 
Yarda's dog, Butch, dies. Yarda is devastated over the loss of his dog, so much so that he builds a casket and puts Butch out on the front lawn so that all the neighbors could come by and, you know, offer their condolences and mourn for Butch. He was so devastated that he left Butch and the casket out on the front lawn for four days to the point where Butch started to smell and Lois had to insist that someone come and remove the casket and Butch from her front yard, Yarda refused to do it. I mean, if that doesn't tell Lois something's not right, what else will, ma'am? One of Lois's friends, Janice from LA, comes to visit. She visits Lois a few times a year. You know, she stays at Lois's house while she enjoys the beauty of Hawaii. She comes to visit and she says that she's talking to Yarda and she lets him know that she had been robbed at gunpoint a few weeks earlier and she's considering purchasing a gun. And out of nowhere, Yarda pulls out a whole arsenal of weapons, including a hand grenade. And I said, but he's got a restraining order. That man's not allowed to have weapons. And then the show says, he's got a restraining order. He's not allowed to have weapons. I knew that. And I was thinking, does Lois know that Yarda has all these weapons in her house? Janice says that she never told Lois about all the weapons. She just assumed that Lois knew already and just didn't think that it would be a problem. I don't understand it. It's a problem, ma'am. So this beautiful place, this beautiful neighborhood turns into a very stressful place to live. Everyone is afraid to do anything. They don't want to go out to their car. They don't want to mow their lawn. Warren is having a difficult time checking his mailbox. Every time he goes out to check the mail, he's ducking and diving and watching and checking and looking because he never knows when Yarda is going to pop up and do something to him or harass him. So he's frightened to check his own mail. And Lois thinks that everybody's harassing Yarda. Once Warren's original restraining order expires, Yarda thinks that it's game on. You know, it's time to go back to harassing Warren 100%. Well, Warren gets together with Rebecca from across the street and they hire an attorney together and they go after Yarda for another restraining order. The judge issues a restraining order for both of them this time. They are temporary restraining orders, but at least it's something. Again, he's not supposed to have any firearms. He's not allowed to take pictures of anyone and he has to stay away from Rebecca and Warren. Because he can't harass Warren and Rebecca, he gets even more awkward and dark. He turns into somewhat of a recluse and stays in the house watching the cameras all day long. Then he has some sort of shoulder accident and he hurts his arm. So he's in the house, popping pain pills, drinking and watching the cameras. This is a recipe for disaster. For some reason, he starts calling 911 to complain about Warren for no reason. And the police keep showing up. And after a while, the cops are pretty pissed and they're tired of dealing with Yarda calling 911 for non-emergency. Did you call 911? I did. Over there. I just came from there, there's nobody there. Pardon me? I just came from there, there's nobody there. Going to arrest me? Not necessary. Oh, well, go on. He's gotten naked. You Listen, Yarda gets arrested for calling 911 for no reason. Lois comes to his rescue. She bails him out and hires an attorney. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? This man is living with you rent free. He is harassing the entire neighborhood. And now he is causing you all of this extra stress and financial stress. And you don't think it's a problem? Yarda needs to get help. So at this point, Lois and Yarda's relationship goes downhill. She starts getting constant calls and emails from neighbors who have decided to file a lawsuit against her. Um, she also starts getting mail every day from different lawyers and law firms. They have let her know that she has got to get rid of Yarda or they are going to sue her and she's gonna lose her home. At the same time, Lois has another friend named Giselle who has a husband and a son, Giselle and her husband and son move into Lois's house. So Gisella, her husband and son live upstairs in Lois's house. 
Yarda lives downstairs and Lois just has her one bedroom. This is way too crowded. At some point, Lois just wants her house back, you know, and I can understand it. It's time for everybody to go. She needs some peace and quiet. The neighborhood wants some peace and quiet. And Yarda is about to have her homeless. Lois is very against having smoking in her house. She doesn't like smoking in her house, outside of her house. If you are on her property, you are not to be smoking. And she has warned Yarda, I don't know how many times to quit smoking on her property. She goes outside, catches him smoking. She tells Yarda that he has to quit smoking. And he lights up another cigarette as if to say, F you, Lois, this is my place. Okay, you don't pay rent here and your name is not on anything, Yarda. She lets Yarda know that this is his 30 day notice. He's got to get out of her house 30 days and you're out. Listen, the neighbors start to see Yarda's boxing up and throwing things out. They start to get excited. Lois lets them know that, you know, he's got 30 days to get out. The neighbors are ecstatic. Yarda is about to be history. Not too fast though. When moving day arrives, Lois realizes that Yarda has locked her out of the basement and barricaded himself in there. And he told her he is not going anywhere. So she told him she was going to legally evict him and she hired an attorney. When Janice comes back for another visit, she finds Lois climbing out of the basement window. That's the only way she could actually get into her basement is climbing through a window because Yarda has barricaded his part of the basement. When it was time for them to go to eviction court, some of the neighbors let her know that they were very worried for her. They didn't know if he was gonna show up for court or not. And she wasn't worried. She just knew that Yarda was gonna come out of the basement, he was gonna go to the eviction court and things were gonna work out fine. The problem is, is Lois really truly believes that Yarda is harmless. On January 19th, 2020, Janice, who's still visiting Lois, at 8.30, she walks down to the Waikiki Beach. Lois realizes that Yarda's barricade is gone, so she decides she's going to head down to the basement to do a little laundry. Giselle hears noise coming from the basement, screams, and she goes to- It was my house, too! Yarda? Lois? Gisela has no idea that Yarda Hanel has brutally attacked Lois. He stabs her in her left breast, in her stomach, and on her legs. Back inside, Yarda resumes his horrific assault on his friend and protector. Officers Tiffany Enriquez and Khalid Kalama are thrust into the chaos. Mr. Hanel! Luckily for Giselle, an army veteran, and he's also a medic, he comes out and he's able to help her, starts giving her first aid while she calls 911. Some of the other neighbors hear her screaming and crying out in the front, and they all come to help. Back inside Lois's house, Yarda continues his assault. Now, one of the things that's really odd about this story, on the show, they didn't really give time frames as to how long these people lived with Lois, but I did a little digging, and according to a lot of news outlets, Yarda lived at Lois's house for 10 years. They also stated that Giselle, her husband and son, lived with Lois for five years. The show made it seem as if she was just living there temporarily until she found her own home, but 10 and five years, that's a long time to be living with someone. It really is. When the police arrived to the scene, Gisela was carried away to safety. When the officers arrived, they rushed in to see what was happening. Tiffany Enriquez and Khalid Kalama show up they rush into danger. They have no idea that Yarda has the whole house surrounded by cameras and they are immediately shot. Both of these officers are struck close range. Both officers were pulled out and rushed to the hospital immediately. Warren gets the police attention and lets them know that there are cameras everywhere. They are being watched and it's gonna be extremely hard to sneak up on Yarda. While the police are trying to come up with a strategy, Yarda is 
pouring gasoline in everywhere. The neighbors are absolutely frightened when they see the first sight of flames. They realize that Yarda has an arsenal of weapons and something is definitely gonna happen when all of that heat gets to those weapons. All of that ammunition that Yarda has possession of starts to ignite. Soon, seven homes in the neighborhood are engulfed by flames. The neighborhood is evacuated and Janice, who was down at the beach, realizes that there's fire in the neighborhood. There's ambulances and police officers and fire engines. And she calls a friend and she says, is that Lois's house? And they told her yes, and nobody has seen Lois. So she knows that Lois is most likely deceased. Giselle survives her attack. However, both of those officers, Tiffany Enriquez and Khalid Kalama do not make it. All seven of those homes were burnt to the ground, including Warren's home. Warren did say that even though he lost his home and all of his possessions, there's nothing worse than losing those police officers in Lois. My heart truly goes out to the families and friends of these brave officers, as well as Lois and Gisela. I'm so happy that she survived and she's able to continue to be a mom and a wife to her husband. And she is a very strong woman. She is very gracious and forgiving and loving. And I'm really glad that she survived. I did do a little bit of digging to find out some additional information that was not included on the show. I did read where Janice said that she did believe that Yardo was an alcoholic, schizophrenic, and he was definitely paranoid. She also stated that she did reach out to social services to seek an elderly check to report elder abuse against Lois and I assume that nothing came of it, that they were not able to press charges against Yarda. The only thing that I was thinking is that maybe Lois could have filed her own restraining order against Yarda, and then the police would have had to remove him from her home. I don't know if that would have changed anything. He seemed to be very determined to burn down the neighborhood. One of the other things that Janice did state was that Yarda, Yarda had always threatened Lois with killing her and burning their house down. I did find some other news clips and I'm gonna share those with you now. This Wednesday, the 22nd of January. Many residents in Diamond Head are piecing together their lives following the tragic murders and devastating fire on Sunday. One neighbor who had a restraining order against the suspect, Jerry Hanel, says more needs to be done to protect residents. Sarah Madison joins us with our top story. Sarah? Joe, we went back to meet with Warren Daniel, the neighbor who guided police to certain locations right after the shooting started. Now, he explains more about the confrontations he had with Hanel and says the underlying discussion to move forward is about mental health. It's kind of like walking in mud with, you know, um, you know, with boots and, and trying to just one step at a time. For Warren Daniel, looking for normalcy can be overwhelming at times. There's a lot of people that, that are, are, are suffering on that street. I don't know what the exact head count is, but if you took an average of, you know, four people times seven homes, it's nearly 30 people. Daniel questions about moving forward without seeing real change that helps protect citizens. Yes, I'll, uh, you know, I can rebuild, but am I rebuilding, you know, in the same spot that there's um, a new Jerry Hanel? They say you can see. Daniel tells us his neighbor, Jerry Hanel, attacked him and broke his shoulder, which led to Daniel filing a temporary restraining order in 2014. But Daniel says that didn't stop Hanel from terrorizing him and his family for several years. We had the first TRO petition filed in October and the order granting it. His attorney, David Hayakawa, had to file motions to modify the original restraining order 
because he says Hanel would find loopholes. Such as he built a, uh, a stand to put a, a, a barbecue on top of the, uh, that just went above the wall, so he'd have to get on a ladder to get up to this barbecue on the stand, load it with wet leaves, start billowing smoke only on days in which the wind blew it into my client's home. Hayakawa says when you file a TRO against a neighbor, you cannot force him or her to move. The court can create all these restrictions. And so uh, that's why we had the problems here, is the landlord, it was up to the landlord to take action. Daniel tells us the horrifying tragedy that took place on Sunday could have been prevented. And he doesn't want to see this happen again. If you're worried about mental health of people who you're issuing temporary restraining orders to and restraining orders to, the underlying thing, the underlying discussion is mental health. So maybe a mental health evaluation should be part of a TRO so you really know. So if someone is, is, is being, um, you know, negatively impactful, you know, verbally or physically or threateningly in terms of, then um, we need to have uh, a way of determining whether this is a systemic issue. Now, under a TRO, a person is not allowed to be in possession of a firearm, but Hayakawa says under current laws, officials do not have authority to search a home for illegal firearms once a TRO has been served. Back to you, Joe. It's a day of mourning for the Honolulu Police Department with flags at half staff and a day of remembrance at the historic Diamond Head neighborhood. Two officers were shot and killed that day by a mentally unstable man who killed his landlord and took his own life. And there was almost a fifth death, a woman who survived that man's violent rage. Tonight, you might be surprised to hear she forgives him. I used to come to water the flowers that I put and I feel like I like had to come back. To understand Gisela Riccardi King's pain, remember what she's been through. He has his two hands on my head and smashed my head against the ground. And I beg him, please, Yard, don't have a son, don't have a son, but he will not let it go. Yard Ahano stabbed her over and over after she discovered he'd killed her friend and landlord, Lois Kane. Hano later killed officers Tiffany Enriquez and Kaulike Kalama, then lit the neighborhood on fire. I drive here every day or I walk when I get out of the kitchen. A year later, Ricardi King's physical wounds are healed. Her emotional wounds are much deeper. That's something that I didn't expect that is going to take so long, and it's going to be uh, so sad. All the things that I had to deal with, uh, myself, my emotions, my super sad days, like uh, my nights, crying and crying, or waking up all the time, or nightmares. She says her heart still aches for the fallen officers and their families, and for Lois. We always remember her, all the time. But for the man who tried to kill her, she feels pity. And don't have any hate for Yarda. I pray for him too. She says it's clear something went wrong in Yarda Hanel's life. He need desperately help and we couldn't. In a way we failed him. Because if we help him, probably this didn't happen. Is the word forgiveness the right word? Yes. Yes. Riccardi King says she had to forgive him to move on. A month after losing everything she had, she says her husband suffered a serious head injury. Then the pandemic took her son out of school. But... Good to see you. Friendships and new beginnings have brought hope. People have been so generous. Um, the community was amazing. I think I, I couldn't do this alone. I have a lot of help. One year later, she has a new place, a new routine, a life without anger. I never hate him, never, even in, I, I just can't. I think he was a victim as well. Gisela, a very strong lady. With seven homes burned down, there's still a big hole in that neighborhood, but several properties are in the early stages of rebuilding. Again, my heart goes out to all parties involved, and I am truly sorry for your loss. Mental health is very serious, and people need to take it seriously.
Yarda needed help, and I wish that somehow they were able to get that help for him. If they had, those officers would still be here, and so would Lois. And until next time, bye.